and I also went there uh, in November again when it was inaugurated or December. Yeah, it was inaugurated by Mr. Narayan Murthy. Uh, I think it was apt that Mr. Narayan Murthy inaugurated because he's someone who does things differently. You know, and this is uh, what you are going to see here is unbelievably true. You know, it's true. I have I've seen it, so I can you know vouch for it. And to present you know the case uh, we have amongst us, uh, uh, Mr. Paul Blackmore. What strikes to me about him is, you know, his achievement at a very young age, you know, so uh, at the age of 23, you know, he started his career actually in St. Gobain. Uh, he was recruited by still at high school uh, by the company and put through a fast track program, including obtaining his first class honors degree in engineering and business studies. Paul, at the age of 12, had quickly moved through ranks to become operations manager of their world's business. Following five years, then saw travel to multiple developing countries to develop the component supply chain, including India, Thailand, Brazil, and China, all emerging markets. At the age 28, Paul was appointed as managing director of a startup business to design, develop, manufacture, and supply a volumetric modular construction product for use in hotels student accommodation and residential. Under Paul's leadership, the business developed its value proposition to offer a full turnkey solution to its client and was widely recognized as the best product in the market for use in hotel accommodation and student accommodation, with more than 40% savings in construction time and an improvement in delivered quality. Over the coming years, Paul aims to bring together his experience that he has you know, gained together uh, for the best technology, techniques and resources to drive through improved safety, quality and efficiencies into construction market. Please welcome Mr. Paul Blackwell. Mr. Blackmore, thanks for my introduction. Uh, when you hear yourself back, you don't know whether to feel proud or embarrassed uh, of, of what you've done. Um, I'm an engineer by training. I am not a healthcare specialist uh, in any way. I have visited many hospitals, uh, mainly because I like cycling, uh, skiing, uh, riding scooters. So I suspect that my time in India, I will be visiting many more hospitals. Uh, so that will be my healthcare experience. Um, I am very passionate about building uh, in the right way. I've spent the last 11 years mainly uh, between China uh, and West Africa, uh, working for a large Chinese group uh, called CIMC. We started the business from zero turnover, uh, and we grew to multiple hundred million uh, within a 10-year period. Uh, we were selling into Europe, uh, selling into places like Nigeria. I have visited a Nigerian hospital as well, um, all across East Africa. Uh, in China, Australia and the US. So I've, I've seen construction uh, in different parts of the world um, and I've seen it done very well and I've seen it done very badly. Uh, one of the questions that was raised earlier is, is India ready for prefabrication? Uh, of course I'm going to say yes. Um, that's what I told my wife when I convinced her that leaving central London and living in Bangalore was one of my better ideas. Uh, at the moment, she's agreeing with me, so we're making the, the right steps. The reason I think India is ready for prefabrication uh, is, is simple. You only have to look at how badly buildings are built in India. It's a very simple equation. Uh, the challenge is that the economics of prefabrication and the behavior of buyers is where the challenge lies. Um, when I started my previous business 10 years ago, a lot of it felt like the attitudes I sense in India today. Uh, there was a lot of scepticism or a lot of positive attitude. It tended to be one or the other. There wasn't much middle ground. So lots of people focused on, uh, in England, you know, pounds per uh, square meter. In the US, it was all dollars per square foot. And here I'm getting used to lakhs and crores uh, per square foot. Um, people, the behavior I've seen here is that people will commit in construction, <coughs> commit to a program they don't believe, 
So they will tell the owner we'll do it in 24 months, but it isn't 24 months. Everyone knows it's not 24 months, but we carry on like it is 24 months. And then surprise, surprise, it's 36 or 48. If you did the economic model at the beginning on what really happened, it doesn't work. Uh, what, what I need to bring to my team, and my team do it as well, is commit to things that they can't achieve, instead of being honest. So when I've been going to meetings about where we are on our projects, and I tell the absolute truth about where we are, I can see a look of surprise that you know, what, this guy's telling me the truth. Uh, so when I say it's 12 weeks, that means 12 weeks. It might be 13, but it won't be more than that. It doesn't mean 24 or 48. Um, so I was happy in my previous job. I grew a very successful business. I didn't really need to work five days a week. I could dip in and dip out as I chose. I had a fantastic team. We delivered a brilliant product to the market. Uh, we were the leader in multiple markets. <coughs> Orders generally came to us uh, because we got the design right of what we did. And that is something else I see here in India, is that the design of buildings happens too late in the process. And then it costs a lot more money. And the reason that the big contractors like that is because that's where they make their money. They absolutely want you to change your mind. What better way to make money than giving somebody a change order? because they know you want it. So yes, that's how much it's going to cost. And it adds chaos into the system. And what I've seen in the supply chain is um, vendor control on construction sites is very challenging. So somebody said to me in my early time in India, factory built product takes away jobs. I disagree. If you can find me the skilled labor that can build on site, I will take all of it. Because even now on our sites, we struggle to find labor that can deliver the right level of quality. So the labor isn't there. And India is on one of the most amazing growth paths. So this problem is gonna get bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, it happened in the UK. People didn't want to work on sites. Surprise, surprise, we had to bring labor in from outside. Um, and it's happening here. As an outsider, as a guest in this country, um, regardless of your political persuasion, what I can tell you as an outsider is that India is on the map more than it's ever been. Um, your Prime Minister is in the international news more than ever. If I asked most of my friends around the world who is the Prime Minister of India today, they would be able to tell you. That isn't true in the past. Some of them would, but not everybody. And as a result of that, more people are looking at India. Um, China is slowing down. I can tell you that from personal experience, having spent the last 11 years there. So people want to invest. Now, there's good quality investment coming into India, which means some of the habits of the past will have to change. Otherwise, the outside investment may not come in the quantum that it could come. Uh, the other fact I saw recently that I thought was interesting is the number of Indians coming back to India. Now, some of that is not by choice, thanks to uh, Donald Trump. Uh, that's a different story that I won't discuss on a public stage. But the other is people are coming back. You know, people have been outside, they're coming back, they're bringing different ideas different technologies, different talents in multiple sectors. So the country is in, in a pretty amazing condition uh, for growth. Uh, GST, you know, when I look at what, I'm glad I wasn't here before <coughs> GST. When I read what GST was, I thought oh, that was fantastic. Um, Demonetisation, again, another fantastic thing. But I look, I, I travelled here 20 years ago the first time and I travelled to China 20 years ago. I went on the same trip, in fact. And India has lagged behind. Uh, obviously, some of that is government-driven. You know, the Chinese government have invested outside. They've driven out bribery. They've driven out corruption. They've invested in infrastructure. India should be in a much better place than China. People are generally more educated. 
uh, people are better travelled. The quality of English here is so much better that exports should be so much higher. I could not believe when I looked through one of our bills of quantity on one of our projects that the windows that had been used on the previous project were made in China and imported into India. I mean, that just cannot be right. I, I know what the blue collar bill is for a Chinese factory and I now know what it is for an Indian factory. India is cheaper. So it should be able to do more than what it's doing. So that's my uh, welcome to India. That's my first three months uh, experience. Why am I here? Um, I met a guy called Faisal. Uh, some of you have met him. Uh, he's quite a force of nature. Um, I was comfortably working away, uh, drinking lattes in London, uh, enjoying life, and he told me what he was doing here. Uh, not just in his commercial business, uh, but in terms of his charitable work. He made his money in Dubai. Uh, him and his wife decided to reinvest into India. So they built a precast uh, off-site factory in Tamil Nadu. Uh, he started investing heavily in schools. Uh, some of you may know the story. Uh, he invested in a girls' school, uh, 2,500 students. Uh, that school is now the third ranked highest uh, government school in India. Uh, we're now on a program of developing a further thousand schools. So this guy was a bit different, a bit more interesting. Uh, one of my good friends who was the head of Hilton had recently moved to India uh, and he was telling me about how he was building hotels uh, in India. I said, how long does it take? He said, well, I was told it would take 24 months. Uh, he said, but we're now up to 40 months and there's no sign of it opening yet. When I used to work with Hilton in Europe, not so much in Africa, in Europe, we used to build 200 bed hotels in 36 weeks. And I will welcome you, to, if any of you go to London, I will tell you where they are and you can go and visit them. You will never know they were prefabricated. So we would build the superstructure of a building in a month including the bedrooms, and I'll show you a picture of what we did at the end of my slide. Now, we're not here to talk about hotels, but the point is that it can be done, and it's done in other countries uh, in the world, and it is growing. It is be prefabrication is becoming the norm. Here, obviously, there's a lot of work to do, the scepticism, um, so I'm going to show you a little bit of what we've been doing and what we intend to do. So this is our facility um, in Tamil Nadu. It's like paradise. Uh, we have elephants, we have monkeys, we have butterflies. Um, and in my first week, I had my first experience of having to deal with a leopard. Uh, I never had to do that while I was living in London. So when they asked me what to do, I said, I have absolutely no idea. <laughs> Hopefully somebody else does. Uh, this, is, this is a fantastic facility. Uh, any of you are welcome to visit. It's a state-of-the-art um, <coughs> unit where we build precast panels. For those of you who don't know what precast is, uh, instead of pouring concrete in the rain um, on site with labour at any height from four floors to ten floors to twenty floors, we pre-design it uh, with the architect, with the engineer and we already know what the panel looks like before it arrives at the construction site. Um, we have our own aluminium and glazing, so we can build our own windows, we can build our own facade. Uh, we use robots to place the glass in the frame. Uh, we have our own joinery facility. So we have a huge control on the supply chain. Um, what that enables us to do is to know when the materials are coming. What that also enables us to do is to fit the brackets for the external facade in the factory, not trying to fit them on a construction site. For those of you who have built healthcare premises, you will know the challenges of being on a construction site. Personally, it's my favourite place. Uh, I don't like being in a suit. I'm usually in jeans and I usually have my sleeves rolled up because uh, that's where the, the excitement is for me. Um, 
In this facility, we have about uh, 500 uh, employees, and we distribute from there within about a 500 kilometer radius is where we can uh, supply product. We're just about to start our first mobile plant up in Lucknow, uh, which is for Lulu. Uh, we're building a shopping mall, uh, 2 million square feet. So we'll adopt the same technology um, that we have here. Uh, we'll have a temporary roof, but the technology, the design, the process, the approach is exactly the same. Um, if Papaya does his job properly, uh, we'll also be doing one in Pune. Uh, that's for an IT building. And again, it's in circa 2 million square feet. So it gives us the opportunity to go to different parts of India. The mobile plant is driven by size of the um, building. If it's less than a million square feet, it doesn't really work. Um, our longer strategy is to have permanent infrastructure in different parts of India. And the, 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 the technology we're using is not uh, is, is highly unusual to India, but is not unusual to other parts of the world. BIM mean, probably means nothing to some of you, and architects in the room will, will know. Um, BIM is, is designing, in simple terms, is designing a building in three dimensions uh, on a computer screen. So you know where everything is. Uh, you know where the pipes are, you know where the lights are, you know where the air conditioning is, all in three dimensions. So you know if a pipe is going to clash with a beam before you start to produce it on the construction site. So you amend the design uh, in the model. In UK, you cannot bid on a public project anymore unless you operate in BIM. That's it. That's the rule. Uh, China is moving the same way. Uh, China just announced that 30% of buildings now must be in precast, uh, not in situ concrete, to try and drive the technological change uh, to improve the infrastructure. Um, what this allows us to do is to design a hospital in three dimensions, and then from that three-dimensional model, we can actually set, now send our shop drawings direct to the factory. So the machines in the factory know how to produce the concrete, they know how to produce the windows, they know how to produce the joinery. So it makes sure there's no errors in our design process. This may or may not start, because I haven't got the <coughs> answer. Let me just, I'll run it from here. This is our facility. Um, this was before it was completely finished. Uh, we still have some elements to finish. Um, that's our joinery shop. So in there we can produce any of the joinery for any of our projects. And we run them as standalone businesses. All the building you see is all precast elements. Couldn't really build it in situ. <laughs> So you see precast panels there, ready to be dispatched. And this is a bit repetitive, so I'll skip this one on now. So this was a, I don't know why it's um, an outdated statistic, but uh, it's from 2010, but the numbers <coughs> are pretty remarkable uh, when you compare India, not only to developed countries, uh, 
but to other emerging countries in terms of bed space. Um, so obviously there's a, in terms of growth, um, I don't know the statistics, I'm sure the operators in the room do, but it's, the sense is that there's a, a, a huge demand for improvement in hospitals and healthcare in the country. How can you do that? Of course you come to us. Um, this is our hospital. Uh, I know some of you have visited it. Uh, this is in Calicut. It, it, it is incredible. Um, and I would welcome any of you to come and visit. I won't run through all of this. Uh, animation but it gives you an idea of how the construction sequence works so we build the foundations um, if there's a basement we use precast walls to retain the ground and then we cast the raft um, traditionally that's one of the only things that we do in situ after that the columns that you see there are designed and manufactured in the factory the beams that then sit onto it are pre-designed, pre-engineered. So we know exactly which beam, which column goes in which place. So you're not creating shutters that you see on a traditional site, uh, trying to control the quality of in-situ concrete, uh, the, the environmental impact of in-situ concrete, the health and safety impact. Uh, on the site next to ours last week, unfortunately, one of the labourers was killed. Um, a tipper truck um, crashed into him while he was trying to pour concrete. Then what you see uh, is bathroom pods and the mechanical and electrical services being lifted in, in a modular way. So instead of running individual cables and individual pipes, we pre-create the elements in 6 metre lengths or 12 metre lengths and lift them in place. So we know where all the hot water is, cold water, fan call units, uh, fire alarm systems, all are in place. And then externally there you see facade panels. So we can build the facade panel in the factory and we fit the window in the factory. So as you lift the facade element, the window is already in place. This is Holocore uh, slabs, uh, widely used technology uh, in the US and a huge uh, amount in uh, Europe. And then that then repeats. So we screed the top and then the rest carries on. So we do the same thing again and again. Uh, that's a MEP module, so again, pre-designed, uh, pre-engineered. Here you see a corridor. This is a bathroom pod. Uh, this is made with uh, gypsum. Uh, I think here people don't like gypsum, so we can also do concrete pods as well. It seems to be a behavioural thing that people don't like gypsum. Uh, in Europe, almost every bathroom is built off-site and it's also built using gypsum walls. Very few now are built uh, using concrete. So why prefabrication? Uh, reduces construction time, that's a given. Uh, reduces project costs. This is where we rely on the owner um, to work on the overall cost of the building. If you look at it on structure, rupees per square foot, we are more expensive. If you look at the benefit of time, and if you look at the integration of a building, instead of treating it as individual packages, then it becomes cheaper for the owner. Um, money here is very expensive. That's one thing that surprised me when I came to India. The only place I've ever built where debt is more expensive than India is in Nigeria. Now, I used to lend money, I, used, I was a builder, and we were also an owner, so I, I can understand both sides. Um, my debt in the UK was at one and a quarter percent per year, not per month. So the value of time was actually less uh, than it is here in terms of utilisation of debt. And then I'll show you some images. 
So this is the hospital. So all the elements you see are from our factory. This is a 208 bed uh, facility. So when you mentioned circulation space earlier, I'm glad to see that our, I can't take any credit, I wasn't here, but our designers had thought about the volume of circulation space. Um, arrival space is significant. <coughs> that then repeats on other floors. So you don't have people crammed on top of each other. Escalators put in place instead of elevators. So there's elevators as well, but if someone just needs to access the first floor, they don't have to queue. They don't have people on beds. They can go straight up the elevator. Uh, that I have seen so many times in European hospitals. Now that to me is the norm. That if you're not, if you don't need to queue at the front desk, you go straight up the elevator, straight up the uh, escalator. Pharmacy built in, uh, automatic dispensing facilities, uh, the wards. We didn't make the beds, they were purchased. Um, corridor, this is a double corridor. So again, talking about circulation space, there are two corridors running each side of the building and you can cross at multiple points down the building. So it's very easy to circulate around the building. And then this gives you a sense of facility. Um, one thing that surprised me uh, here was there's no contrast between floor and wall, or very little contrast. Uh, in, in hospitals that I've built before, there would always be a contrast for partially sighted. So I don't know if that's an oversight on our side uh, or whether that is allowed to happen here. But that was the one thing that stood out to me that I would expect a, a contrast. And patient recovery, you can see trees going back to the previous presentation. Uh, I thought that was a CGI, but of course the benefit of being in Calicut is it's not difficult to see a tree. <laughs> Uh, so we luckily utilise that, um, but again I can see design details that I would improve for our next project. Um, things like, they told me that the blinds are blackout, and I said to my guys, that, no they're not. Said, yes sir, they are, we promise they are. I said, I can tell you they're not. So turn off the light and wind down the window, no, wind down the blind. So they put down the blind and I said, look, I can still see you. That means they're not blackout. Blackout means it's black. I said, there's a gap down the side here. Only a small gap, but enough to let light through. See, I've worked in hotels where blackout means absolute blackout. Otherwise, you fail. So they all thought that was hilarious. But it's the tiniest detail that could have made a significant difference. That should have been designed in from the beginning. That all we needed was a simple runner on the blind, and the whole room was a blackout and it would have cost nothing in the overall scheme of the project. <coughs> and these are different rooms. Again, all the upholstery all done in the factory. So we control the delivery, we control the quality, so we can ensure that it comes at the right time. That's a bathroom pod, so that was built in the factory and lifted from our factory and delivered uh, to Calicut in that condition. That is the norm where I've previously worked. You would not dream of building individual bathrooms on a construction site. It just does not make sense. This, uh, this isn't a hospital. This is one of my old rooms. Um, this is a Hilton Garden Inn. The picture you see there is how it left China. So that is in a factory in China. That room now, if any of you go to the UK and go to a place called Birmingham, uh, the airport of Birmingham, the Hilton Garden in there was built in China. And it came exactly like that. So this is not a pipe dream. This is not potential. This is happening. 
Uh, I used to deliver three to 4,000 rooms a year, every year, just in the UK uh, for hotels using this technology. We're about to launch a hybrid of it where we still use the precast, but we create the individual room in a volumetric unit. The reason for that is Indian roads are a little bit more difficult than British roads. Um, so we used to ship a room, a corridor, and a room in one module. So that module would be from here to the back wall. So 15, 16 metres, four metres in width, and we would lift uh, between 20 and 30 a day uh, units. So you get over 40 bedrooms every day installed. So we're working on a hybrid now of how we can do that. And the road infrastructure is where it fails. It doesn't fail in the technology. And that's a view looking down the room. But everything you see there, except the pillow, is how it left the factory. So the fan coil was in, the artwork is on the wall, the hangers for your jacket are in the room. And then that's the bathroom. And that's me. So, thank you. Any questions? George, you have to ask lots of questions. <laughs> Yeah, seismic zone three, we work in already, uh, seismic zone four as well. So, the hostel was designed by you guys, or was it a separate architect? Um, on this one, it was a separate architect. We, my personal view is it should always be a separate architect. Um, each sector has its own unique element. So is it necessary to uh, keep the limitations of your system in mind when you design the building? Or? Yeah, I, I, I wouldn't use the word limitations. <laughs> it is. It's important. There's no point pretending that you can do anything because you can't. Um, the, best, the best product I ever built was built with the good architect. So the architect understood what our parameters are. Is there certain... a curve for the architect to understand that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and what, we, what I found in my old job is some architects saw us as a threat. Um, my view was the opposite. My view was that the market was changing. Um, there was shortage of skills. Um, things were taking a long time to build and people were looking at prefabrication, whether that was in Africa or whether it was in Europe. The smart architects learn how to do it. So they made less fee per project. In percentage terms, they made less. In margin terms, they made a lot more because they didn't have to design every building from scratch. They used the parameters and repeated them in different buildings. Then they promoted themselves as experts. And they made a lot of money, the architects. The same with the engineers. The problem I see in India is the way that the PMC convinced the PMC to come on board with you. Because again, they could do the same. Contractors are always client suspects the contract. There is no inherent trust. Yeah. The big trust deficit between the client and the contract. Correct. And that, that, that also is the same in any, any place I've worked. You know, one thing I learned was never trust the contract. So by being in the prefab system, does that uh, become a little more uh, well, less, less? Yeah, well, we, we, because we can build the entire building, so we don't need to rely on the traditional contracting approach. So as long as the owner has the trust in us, uh, we can be transparent. We're very happy to be transparent with our costings. Uh, Faisal, the owner, his interest is doing the right things back in India. He doesn't need the money anymore. Um, he, he will declare our margin to the owners. If he's comfortable, he'll tell you what we're making. You don't see that very often. Um, and that was one of the things that attracted me to come and join this company, was doing things in the right way. And the reality is the money will come anyway. The structure is designed totally by the structure.
Structure structures designed by us. Structures designed by us, yeah. Structural engineering. We will outsource sometimes as well. So we work, again, if we just did all the structural engineering, we would alienate structural engineers. So it's important to have a balance of working with the right people. So we have a number of engineers we will work with who do some of our work for us. So it keeps us open to the market then. You know, we don't want to be enemies of people. We want to be friends with people. Cost, very expensive. Um, so if you, take, if you take this hospital, we're in the range of 5,500 to 6,000 uh, per square foot. Uh, but visit the hospital first before you judge whether that's expensive. You need to see what's in it. If you look at structural cost, we're in the range of 1,300 per square foot. So we are more than, we are more than in situ, uh, but we can deliver the structure so much quicker. Oh, in Kerala? Yeah. I was sorry, when I said 1300, I meant 1500. <laughs> but the, the, the biggest benefit is that we can do things in the structure if we're working with the client. So we can fit the brackets that hold the facade at the factory. So the pure cost on the structure is more, but the value is much higher if we work from the beginning with the architect, with the owner so that we understand each other, and then we can build significantly quicker. Yes, I mean, yeah. uh, why did you choose steel? We saw a lot of concrete being used. All your precast members are concrete. Why not steel? Because <laughs> Mr. Faisal uh, spent $80 million on a concrete plan. <laughs> That's the only reason. <laughs> My background is steel. As you go higher, the lifting will become much more difficult. Uh, not really, because the element weight is, in terms of steel, is, is lesser. But the heights that we're working on, the range of the crane uh, is, is the critical element. So as long as we can get to the side of the site, the tower crane increase as a percentage of the build cost is not that significant. Now, do I think steel will, will grow in India? Of course it will. Um, but I think that is another step. Now, would I tell Faisal to invest in steel right now? Probably not. Um, you know, in, in Europe, you see less and less concrete. It's very much more steel. And the same happened in China in the time I've been there. there there's a lot more steel buildings. My sense, and I'm, I'm naive to India at the moment, my sense is steel is still not quite accepted. For industrial buildings, yes. For hospitals, I think not quite. A composite might work. Not Correct. Many people are exploring it. We are. Uh, yeah. So we're working with one of the biggest steel fabricators actually to look at a composite. Uh, 3.5 lakh. Uh, 18 months. If you've met Mr. Faisal, you'll understand that that was about 24 hours. Um, <laughs> what it should be is at least three months. Yeah, at least. That's my opinion. Spend the time at the beginning. Don't spend the time at the end. If you do it right at the beginning, which is a cultural change, is to not start throwing soil from the ground. Do it right at the beginning, and get the design right, and all the benefit comes at the end. The change orders don't come. I've never given a change order in my old company. How convenient you get, uh, uh, how convenient it will be for a design change? It depends what you want to change. So I, I was asked the same question earlier. If you want to take out a structural wall, then it becomes a problem. Um, if you want to rearrange the internals, it's less of an issue depending on what you're doing. Uh, on, even on the Mitra, um, Mr. Faisal sent his children 
and his uh, nieces and nephews to look at the hospital last month. And they gave some ideas as you know, 22, 23, 24 year olds. So we've now had to build in some things that weren't originally designed. Uh, we now have a business lounge. That wasn't there in the beginning. So it's not a big headache, but the attitude should be the opposite. The attitude should be, how do I minimize design changes? OK, so uh, I think I'll, I'll step in here because people have to catch flights to go back. You know, we have a very interesting me. panel discussion. Thank you so much, Paul. You know, it, it's been, you know, I think we should give him a big hand. And I'll call, you know, uh, uh, the critique always. Uh, George, please come on stage and felicitate. It was an excellent way of you know, putting it across.